Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gerald. Uh, I, lead, I lead a midweek home group, and I serve on the management council. And for some shocking reason, I was chosen to be the people's warden. Just a few words from our previous song to reflect on. Your blood poured out. My sins are raised. It was my death that you died and raised to life. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God. So since we're now raised to life and have access to God, let's talk to Him together. When I say, uh, Lord, in your mercy, you respond. Hear our prayers. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do for us. You started with the creation of the universe by a word. And then when we sinned, you provided your rescue plan through Jesus. And now you hold us tight as we live in this broken and corrupt world. We wait to be united with you until one day in death, we will join you in eternity. Please keep us mindful of your many graces in our lives. Of the many times when we have failed to live, live godly uh, lives and yet you forgave us. Please help us to turn contrition into a grateful, positive response by living more and more for you every day. Lord, in your mercy, In a world where people insist on redefining lies as if they are truths, we especially need your help, Lord. When Timothy teaches us that character matters when it comes to the leaders of our church, and so we continue to ask Heavenly Father for your help to choose men and women who are godly leaders and who are strong in the faith and who have steadfast and faithful character. We don't just pray this for our leaders here at St. James, but for our whole denomination and indeed the church all over the world. Lord, in your mercy, we know that you have blessed this church so much in the past and still continue to do so today with godly leaders, faithful volunteers and regular givers. Please help us to make wise use of all that we have for the sharing of the gospel and for the benefit of your chosen people. Keep us safe, we ask, from the risks of pride and greed that so often derail churches from serving you. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Lord, we ask you to bless Scott with your true words for us today. May we hear your voice as he speaks. And may we go away honoring you more because of what we have heard. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Thanks, Gerald, for leading us in a time of prayer. Uh, Just a couple of news items uh, for us. Uh, First of all, if you're watching at home, Good to have you tune in. We are aware that there's a sound problem, um, so just bear with us as we try and fix that. Uh, so if you are watching and you're hearing a humming sound, don't worry, we, we're on it and hopefully it will be fixed soon. And then for the rest of us here in the building, remember after the service, if you go into the DG Mills, uh, there's, some, there's coffee available as well as some pastries. I said last week the coffee is free, but the pastries you have to pay for. If, you, if that's a struggle for you, pay pastries. It both starts with a P. So just remember that. PP coffee free it even rhymes look at that hey um pastries you pay coffee is free and you might want to get that and go enjoy it the grass is open the fence is not to keep you out it's to keep children in and safe but you can go there and it's strategically placed that is where the sun is years cold their sun right to so take your warm coffee your paid pastry and you go and fellowship that side after the service and then Again, as the winter months are coming up, it's going to probably get even more colder. So don't forget to dress warm when you come to church. You can bring a blanket as well, just so that we can still have doors and windows open. We need to do that, but you guys can be warm. 
And then last bit of news, on Thursday, the 26th of May, is our Ascension Day services. There's one uh, at lunchtime, half past 12, and also one on the 26th in the evening at 7 o'clock here in the auditorium. So Ascension Day service, Thursday, the 26th of May. Now the humming sound is fixed, but now the mic's broken. Um, guys, multitask there at the back. Um, Annabeth, will you read? Hopefully with a mic that works. Uh, thank you. John just reset the desk. One two. One two. One two. Still working, good. If in doubt, we set the computer. Thank you. Good morning. The reading is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Okay. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather Train yourself for godliness, for while boldly training is, some, is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have, hopes, we have our hope set on the living God, who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy, when the council of the elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourselves in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. I thought I was going to be shouting this sermon, uh, which I'm okay with, but uh, well done at the back for getting us back on, back on track. Keep 1 Timothy chapter 4 open before you and let me ask you a question. The question is this, what makes for a good leader in God's church? That's a question that keeps Christian publishing companies in business. I've got plenty of those books on my shelf. What makes a good leader? Well, is it vision? 
or strategy, uh, maybe evangelism or pastoral care. Perhaps it's a leader who can think outside the box. Well, every book you read will have its own recipe for leader success, and the good books are pretty persuasive. This morning in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul wants to persuade Timothy, the Christians in Ephesus, you and me, of the kind of leader that God's church really needs. You'll see it in verse 6. Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. The goal of this chapter and the point of this sermon is to define that word good. But this isn't just a chapter for leaders. You have an opinion about what makes a good leader in God's church too. And if you don't, you should. It's hard to overestimate just how important this is for you. Here's why. Have a look at the start of chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says that Christians who devote themselves to following false teachers will in the end depart from the faith. But at the end of the chapter, verse 16, he says, if Timothy continues leading the church as a good servant of Jesus, he will save both himself and his hearers. So if you listen to the wrong kind of leader, then you're putting yourself in eternal danger. It's that serious. For you, this morning, chapter 4 may be the difference between remaining in the faith and departing from it. So from chapter 4, here is Paul's definition of good, summed up in a sentence. A good servant of Jesus keeps a close eye on themselves and a close eye on the teaching so that by their example, people can be saved. If you're taking notes, I'll say it again. A good servant of Jesus keeps a close eye on himself and a close eye on the teaching so that by their example, people can be saved. Now, Paul wants Timothy to be this good servant. But before we jump in, I want you to look at verse 12. Just cast your eyes down the page. In verse 12, Paul also tells Timothy to set an example for the believers in his speech, conduct, love, faith and purity. So although keeping a close eye on himself and on the teaching is how Timothy is to be a good servant of the church, Paul also wants the Christians in Ephesus to follow his example. And he wants you to follow this example too. Now we're going to look at the good leader in just a moment, but I think it's worth understanding why the church needs leaders like this in the first place. And the answer is in verses 1 to 5. God's church needs to be led by good servants because the most dangerous attack to the church comes from within. Now that shouldn't come as a great surprise because there in verse 1, Paul says the Spirit clearly warns us that this will happen. Verse 2, the bad leaders, uh, elsewhere Paul calls them false teachers, were liars and their conscience was seared. Sounds like a stake, doesn't it? It's a lot more serious than that. Now, you might remember last week, chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says the church is the foundation of the truth. And he includes that little six-line poem to demonstrate that the truth we hold firm and hold high is nothing else except the gospel of Jesus. Now, the false teachers are liars because their God talk is not gospel talk. In fact, in verse 1, Paul says their deception is so serious because they are no longer spokesmen for God. They actually speak for the demons. Any religion without gospel truth is demonic. 
Now, this doesn't mean that they were sacrificing goats and pouring blood on upside-down crosses and wearing dark hooded robes. It's not that kind of stuff you see in the movies. These guys looked respectable. Uh, They stood up in churches. Uh, They weren't coming from the outside. They were coming from the inside. And it was looking, at first glance, like they might be legit. But they deceived people by making an imitation look like the real thing. Now, we know how that works, don't we? I've got a friend who wanted to buy a special present for his wife and he saw a guy at the traffic lights selling perfume. It was in the original box with the cellophane wrapping. It was so cheap. He thought to himself, how can I not go for this? So he paid for it. He took it home. He checked it when he opened it. And when he sprayed a little bit of the perfume, it was just water. (laughs) Who would have thought? We see it all the time, don't we? Something of value. Something that is precious, something that you see merit in will always get copied, ripped off. There'll be a knockoff of it. And at first it will look good and it will may even seem appealing. But of course it has none of the substance or the value of the original. False teaching always follows the same pattern. It dazzles, but then it distorts and then it deceives, and then it destroys. That's what Paul is warning about in chapters 1 to 5. The talk of a seared conscience is that their sense of right and wrong has been like burnt until it's lost all feelings. Their teaching is lies and their behaviour is morally numb, it's morally dead. So those are the two areas of their failure, teaching and lifestyle. Contrast that to the good servant that Timothy is to be and that the Christians in Ephesus are to imitate. Verse 6, Timothy is to be trained in the true words of the faith, teaching. And verse 7, he is to train himself for godliness, lifestyle. And you see those two criteria repeated again in verse 16. Paul says, keep a close watch on yourself and a close watch on your teaching. Those are the two areas that make the difference between a good servant and a false teacher. That's what to look for. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on these false teachers, but just to say Paul does give us a quick example of their lies Verse 3, they forbid marriage and certain foods. Now, we'd probably like a little bit more detail than that. It's very brief. But the point is, Paul didn't need to go into detail because the Ephesians knew exactly what he was talking about. They were living this problem in their church. Back in chapter 1, Paul says that these are the ones who want to be teachers of the law but really have no clue what it is they're talking about. This, I think, was part of their twisting of the Old Testament. They taught that godliness meant that you had to say no to marriage. Probably, I suspect, because they wanted people to say no to sex. And also, godliness meant you had to say no to certain foods. But look how Paul corrects this deceptive teaching in verses 3, 4 and 5. God created both food and marriage and sex... To be good and to be received. They're for you. To be received with thanksgiving by those who know the truth. So when God made sex and food, it wasn't some kind of cruel test. He invented these wonderful things and said, look how good these are. But you can't touch them. Godliness says no. God's not a tease like that. No, they're created by God and they are good and he's gifted them to you. If you believe the truth, you will use them as he intended. Sex only within marriage and food without gluttony or greed 
or letting it master you. Now receive sex and food in that way and you can be thankful. I think that's what Paul means when he says they are made holy by the word of God and prayer. What that doesn't mean, actually, first of all, (laughs) is that if you sleep with your girlfriend, you can turn around, read a Bible verse, say a prayer, and it makes it all okay. That's not what it's saying. The point is that if sex and food, marriage, sex and food, is used according to God's word, and with thankfulness in your heart, expressed in your prayers, then these are wonderful expressions of true godliness. Here's the point that Paul uses to set up the rest of the chapter, though. The false teachers were saying that godliness comes from what you do or don't do. Paul says, no, that's not what godliness is. Godliness, he tells us in chapter 3, verse 16, the mystery of godliness, it's not found in rules. It's found in Jesus and what he has done for you. In other words, godliness is to live in response to the goodness of God to you in Jesus. Godliness is the life you lead in response to the goodness of God to you in Jesus. When you believe the truth about Jesus and his gospel, it makes you thankful, not fearful. It means you get to say yes, just as much as you'll say no. The way then for a good servant of Jesus to avoid the lies and the seared conscience of the false teachers is to keep a close eye on themselves, a close eye on the teaching, so that by their example, people can be saved. So what does it mean for Timothy to keep a close eye on himself? Well, let's pick it up in verse 7. Timothy, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. So, Timothy, the good servant, must train himself for godliness and that's an example that the church is to follow. Now, remember what godliness is. Godliness is to live in response to the goodness of God to you in Jesus. And the word train tells you how to do that. Now, here's the good news. You already know how to do that because every single person in this room, I'm sure, has trained themselves for something. Whether it be to run a 10K race, to learn the piano, to become fluent in a new language, you had to train yourself, didn't you? You know how this works. You did it every day. You did it over and over again. You made a bunch of mistakes, but you also made progress. And every time you trained at that thing, it left a deeper impression in your life. Ask the parent of a child who started to learn the violin at age five what that's like. It's awful. (laughs) It's horrible. It's painful. Ask the five-year-old what it's like, and they're not enjoying it that much either, I can guarantee you. And that's because when you start training at something new... You don't enjoy its benefits at first because you're not very good at it. But go back to that story 15 years later when the child is now 20 and playing the violin in the concert hall and the benefits of the training are obvious and everyone's enjoying it. Not just the kid and the parent, but everybody else as well. Notice that Paul says to Timothy, he must train himself for godliness. Now that doesn't mean you can't accept help from others. The letter of 1 Timothy is Paul giving his assistance to Timothy precisely because Timothy can't do it alone. 
So we always want to help each other and receive help from one another. But training for godliness does require a responsibility on Timothy's side. Train yourself. That doesn't happen by osmosis. So if you want to grow in godliness, you can't be a passenger in this process either. St. James will do it with you, but we can't do it for you. At some point, you've got to pick up this responsibility like Timothy, and you've got to carry it yourself. See, growing in godliness doesn't happen by magic. God activates it, if I can use that language, through the concrete habits of spiritual discipline. That's just Christian talk for training. The concrete habits of spiritual disciplines. I think sometimes we misunderstand how the Holy Spirit works. I think sometimes we expect the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to suddenly manifest in extraordinary ways. When all along, and this passage is a perfect example, God has actually promised that His Holy Spirit will do most of His work in your life with your cooperation in the everyday and the ordinary. That's where change happens. That's how change happens. So don't despise the little things. Washing up. Calling a friend in your growth group to check in how they are. Praying. Reading your Bible. Coming to church. Prove you can be faithful there. Train yourself in those ordinary, everyday, seemingly inconsequential moments and God will start to grow your capacity for greater godliness. The encouragement you need to train yourself in this way, I think, is right there in verse 8. There is nothing in life that is not better with godliness. While physical training is of some value, godliness sometimes works. No, that's not what he says. Godliness has value in all things. It holds promise now, it works today, but it also has promise for eternity. It works into the future. You will enjoy marriage more if you're married if you are growing in godliness and encouraging your spouse to do the same. Making a hard choice or living with the consequences of a bad choice is going to be better if you have benefited from some training in godliness. The training is not only for now though. Paul says it also keeps you on track for the life to come. So as Timothy is to keep an eye on himself... He is also to keep his eyes on the prize. I've heard that before somewhere. It's the lesson of the story of the two stone cutters, the two stonemasons working in a quarry. Same tools, same job, labouring away side by side. Someone walks past and says to the first stone cutter, what are you doing? And he says, I am cutting stones into perfect blocks. And he turns to the second stone cutter and he says, what are you doing? And he looks up and says, I'm building a cathedral. Practicing godliness is not just cutting stone blocks day by day. Practicing godliness is you building a cathedral. The point of the story is, remember what your daily habits are for. They are preparing you for the day of judgment. They are a dress rehearsal for heaven. And if you don't keep your eyes on eternity as you train for godliness today, then all that practice will lose its purpose. Because let's be honest, training is hard work and it doesn't always feel glamorous. And you don't always notice the progress in the moment. That's why you've got to look back and see where you've come from and you've got to look forward and see where you're going. You keep that big picture view as Paul is giving us here, and all of a sudden the training looks a lot different. 
Verse 10, therefore training yourself in godliness is something that's worth your hard work. Paul says, to this end, we toil and we strive. Paul's intentional and expects Timothy to be intentional too. It's no different for us. What does that hard work look like? Well, in verse 15, Paul says, Timothy is to practice these things. In verse 16, he said he must persist in them. And the goal is so that everybody might see his progress. The goal of training in godliness is not perfection. God will see to that in heaven. But for now, your goal is just to make progress. One step each day. That's all God asks. Now you can tell Paul was a preacher. Just look at that alliteration. Persistent practice towards progress. Oh, love it. That's daily reinforcement without giving up. That's what he's saying. It's the discipline of creating spiritual habits over time. So practice persistently until you make progress. Now, if you start that on Monday, will it be fixed by Tuesday? The answer is no, probably not. Because it needs something else too, doesn't it? Are you ready for it? This is going to blow your mind. Patience. It had to be. Persistent practice towards progress takes patience. It doesn't come all at once. But here's the thing. It will not come at all unless you start today. So, start today. The end of verse 10 is the encouragement you need not to delay. We toil and strive because, Paul says, we have set our hope on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. Now, this verse is here to encourage Christians in their training. But let me just speak to you first if you're not yet a Christian. Because there is a great word here for you. And that is that God is the saviour of all people. That means there is no one whom God does not want to save. And that means he wants to save you. It means you need saving. And God has perfectly positioned you here this morning so that you would hear this verse. You do not fall into becoming a Christian. You don't just stumble into it by chance. Paul says God's the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. In other words, his salvation is available for everybody, but it's only effective if you believe it. So believe it. That's how you receive it. What a tragedy it'd be to come here this morning, end up hearing this word and then walking away without taking it. So please, if this is for you and you are not yet a Christian, God is your saviour and he wants you to believe so that he can save you. But for those of us who have already crossed that line, these are encouraging words to us as we strive to train ourselves for godliness. Paul's point is that when you do believe, your hope is not in your own hard work. Your hope is in the living God. He brings you salvation and he will see it to completion. God is on the side of those who believe in Jesus. Your training for godliness will bear fruit, but not because you're particularly good at it. I'm sure you get better over time. I think I'm probably a bit better now than I was when I started. But there's no way in the world that the change is going to happen in my life because of my best efforts. Training in godliness bears fruit because God is the saviour and he will see it done. So even when the training is painful, he will get you to where you need to be. That's why you start today. Because God's got it. For Timothy to be this good servant, he mustn't only keep a close eye on himself, but he must also keep a close eye on the teaching. It's there throughout the passage. Have a look in verse 6. Put these things before the brothers, being trained in the words of faith 
and good doctrine. You see it there again in verse 11. Command and teach these things. And it's there in verse 16. Keep a close eye on the teaching. The teaching? What is that? Well, the teaching is the gospel. It's the message. And Timothy's job is to pass that on without distortion, distraction or deception. That's what will set him apart from the false teachers. And that's how the Christians in Ephesus will know who to listen to and who to follow. That is the good servant of Jesus that God's church needs. Now, Timothy was a young man, and what if the Christians in Ephesus didn't want to listen to him? He may not have been as experienced as some of the older men and women in the church. And I guess when that dynamic's at play, the hesitation of the older over the younger is understandable. Paul's answer is that Timothy must set them an example. Timothy will persuade them of the teaching that is the gospel, not just by how he preached, but how, by how he lived. Now, back in chapter 1, we've already seen this at play. Do you remember back in chapter 1, the proof of the trustworthy saying that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners is Paul's own story, Paul's life. He says, once I was a violent man and a persecutor, but now I've received the mercy of Jesus. Well, in the same way, they should listen to the gospel from Timothy because his life will be the proof that this message is true. Look at Timothy's changed speech. Look at his transformed conduct. Look at his deepening love. Look at his strength and faith. Look at his ongoing purity. Don't reject the teaching. And Timothy, make sure that your life matches your teaching. Well, how is it that Timothy, Timothy, Tim, Timothy, oh, Timothy, I think, yeah, I need to go to the physio for my tongue. How is it that Timothy should teach the church? Well, verse 13, he must read publicly from the scriptures. That is, he must teach God's word, not his own opinion. Don't go to a church where the preacher preaches his own opinion. It's a bad church. He must exhort people, which means to urge them, to persuade them. He's got to grab them by the scruff of the neck because this is urgent and important. And he must teach them, bring instruction and training. I said the other week, those aren't three different things. They're all part of the one endeavor. Interestingly, in chapter 4, verse 1, some of the Christians in Ephesus had devoted themselves to the false teaching and were suffering because of it. The only way to fix that, says Paul in verse 13, is for Timothy to devote himself to the task of the teaching. And verse 14, he was not to neglect this gift. The elders had laid hands on him and set him apart for this ministry. It was kind of like his ordination. So this, the teaching, was to be Timothy's priority in Ephesus. Now, that doesn't mean that preaching is all the church needs. It's not. Preaching is essential in church, but it's not sufficient. It's to be at the centre. It's the one gift that upholds all the others. But of course, there was more that happened in Ephesus than just preaching and teaching. And there's an important example for us, or application rather, for us here at St. James, I think, especially in this season. Because I think a couple of preachers can teach the whole church. But you need more than just a couple to care for the whole church. You need more than just a couple to train the whole church. As we return and rebuild from the last two years, we're going to need more help to get the job done. And a lot of that help is going to come from you as we train 
each other up, to be part of this work. But it's also going to include growing our staff team at the same time. The financial support for the lawn project was fantastic. Because so many of you saw value in it, I I presume, you were willing to give generously. So when the time comes for us to add to the staff team, I want you to be just as enthusiastic about that as you were for the grass. How about we make that deal? (laughs) Because that will ensure that at St James, those gifted to teach don't neglect the gift, just as Paul didn't want Timothy to neglect it in Ephesus. Well, this week as I was preparing, I I had this funny feeling the whole whole week that chapter 4 felt unusually familiar. And I couldn't put my finger on it until halfway through the week. Then I realised that when I was ordained a presbyter in this church, the bishop read these words from the prayer book. He said, know that you can in no way lead men and women to salvation other than on the authority of the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, you must read and study them thoughtfully, continually, shaping your life and the lives for whom you are responsible according to their teaching, that all may be godly examples for the people to follow. Now, I said yes to those words 15 years ago, and the reason I stood here and said yes was because God is the saviour of all who believe and instrumental to that salvation is his church. I said yes to keeping a close eye on myself and a close eye on the teaching so that by my example, people might be saved. But Timothy wasn't to do that alone. We've seen that this morning. Paul expects the Christians in Ephesus to be part of this too. He wanted their buy-in. So this morning, join me and others, everyone in fact here, so that together we can say yes to these words and keep shaping this church into the kind of church that God wants it to be. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that as we see this wonderful picture of your church, your family, your people, we can't avoid the fact that you have called us to something so much bigger than ourselves. You are the saviour of all who will believe. So, Father, we pray that this church is able to, to hold up and hold out that message to the world so that people will come and find Jesus. Father, we pray that in both our conduct and in the teaching, that we make it easy for people to see Jesus. We pray that you would prosper the work of our hands to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to finish with two songs uh, this morning uh, that tie in with what we've just heard. So um, the first one is called By Faith, um, but the chorus says, We will stand as children of the, of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. It's just what we've been talking about. And then we'll conclude with a song that says, uh, We will be a church who is ready for the return of Jesus.